Our next speaker, Dr. Irina Gamel, holds a Canada Research Chair in Modern Literature and Culture at the Ryerson University in Toronto, where she is Professor of English and also directs the Modern Literature and Culture Research Centre. She's the author of many articles and books focusing on issues of gender, modernism, and the avant-garde. She is the author of Baroness Elsa, Gender, Dada, and Everyday Modernity, MIT Press, and most recently, co-editor of Body Sweats, The Uncensored Writings of Elsa von Freitag Longhofen, MIT Press, and Crystal Flowers, Poems and Libretto by Florine Stettheimer. Her current research focuses on the literature and visual culture of the First World War with a focus on Canada. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me through this? Yeah, okay, super. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here at this symposium and congratulations to all of the organizers for this absolutely fantastic exhibition and symposium. I think we will all go home back to Canada with uh, uh, resonances from the research that has been generated as a result of this fantastic event. So thank you so much, Adina, Nita, and all of the organizers, and a big round of applause for all of them. I also look forward to seeing the Baroness appear and be impersonated here by Anna in just a moment. And my focus today is a little bit more on the Baroness and uh, New York data. All America is nothing but impudent, inflated, rampantly guileless burgers, tradespeople, and I alone cannot fight a whole continent. So raged the German-born uh, Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhofen in a letter that was filed by the editors of the Little Review in 1922. And the Little Review was the most avant-garde magazine at that time. The Baroness, as she was called, was an experimental poet. She was also a body artist, and she was a Dadaist who hailed from Berlin, and so she brought all sorts of interesting influences with her to New York. A war widow in New York, she was notorious for excoriating America and America's cultural icons during the First World War era, and she really was in New York from 1913 to 1923. During this time, she had an important impact on the shaping of New York data, and she's been the focus of many recent studies. So she's really come into her own more recently. Here in the slide, we see the gender-bending pose of the Baroness in 1915. We see her in her performance costume, and as you can see, it's really wrapped tightly around her body, almost like a futurist uh, costume. Referencing the cataclysmic war, the striking cubist pattern evokes the dazzle camouflage painted on ships and airplanes to confuse aerial observers and disorient the enemy. Her head here is adorned with an aviator hat and a feather. I am not merely the model who poses, she told the New York Times reporter in the summer of 1915, and that was the time when this particular picture was taken. Driven by that raging protest against the conventional, I seek to give artistic expression. This was a boldly new art form for which the name had not yet been invented. And in this lecture, I would like to focus on the Baroness's vivid and impactful innovation, namely her transference of performance from the stage to everyday life, what today we would call performance art. 
I focus on her fusion of art and life as the Baroness embraced an art form that was both creative but was also dangerous. And ultimately, I argue in this lecture, as I've done in my book, that the Baroness was a kind of catalyst in New York who infused her iconoclastic vision of art into others, including Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp, Berenice Abbott, William Carlos Williams, and other artists, writers, and poets. Since others ignited their own creative practices, often through the Baroness, she was a kind of living spark plug in New York who helped set in motion New York's modernity. To begin then, let's recall New York during the war years. And we see New York here in a wonderful painting by Florine Stettheimer uh, with Liberty on the left. We have here the military vessel on the right with the cannons showing, the flag showing, and then in the center, Manhattan. And you can see that the skyscrapers are just in the process of being built. With war raging in Europe, New York, like Zurich, had become a safe haven for expatriate European artists who tried to escape conscription. In 1915, artists like Marcel Duchamp, Francis and Gabriel Picabia, Juliette Roche and Jean Crotty arrived in the new, new world and joined their American counterparts including Man Ray, who was then a young photographer, pioneering photography as art. But also American painters and poets like Marston Hartley or Joseph Stella, and of course, the poets like William Carlos Williams, who would later write that during this period, he and his peers were, as he puts it, burning with the lust to write. The artists met in various salons, both on the Upper West Side and in Greenwich Village. And their Dada art was really uh, fueled through these various salons, through people getting together, looking at the art on the walls, through performances and so forth, and also through the magazines. There was The Blind Man, for example, launched in 1917, and then New York Dada launched in 1921 and the Little Review, and the Little Review was the longest living one, starting in 1914, and it went to the late 20s. Here, within a loosely assembled group of experimental and proto-Dada artists, the Baroness became, ironically, the American Dada, who embodied the Little Review's motto, making no compromise with the public taste. Dada, and Adina has mentioned this already this morning, was the kind of wild offspring of the First World War. It was really a movement uh, born of displaced refugees and exiles and a fiercely anti-bourgeois protest movement in art that started in Zurich where the term Dada itself was born in February of 1916 before moving to Paris and Berlin, and then many other city centers, as we know. Dada was militant and sought to provoke and shock. In New York, Dada gave birth to new forms, including the ready-made, yeah, almost to the day 100 years ago, but also to the found object and the assemblage sculpture of various objects <coughs> that was pioneered by the Baroness. Dada confronted American commercialism, explored gender and sexual identities, as we've also heard in Janine's presentation here, and it also engaged the war. Dada was not content with having viewers behold new art forms, but it really endeavored to provoke audience responses. So it was not just about creating a new style in art, it was about a much deeper rejection and it was about provocation at some level and getting responses from each other. Artists engaged each other in a new way, directly confronting each other's work in public 
whereby the works themselves often became part of an ongoing conversation through cut and paste techniques and rigorous recycling. Some of these strategies uh, kind of subverted traditional claims to authorship and even originality. In this slide on the left, a work that is held here at the Israel Museum, so we are very, very pleased uh, with the uh, Arturo Schwartz collection and what it holds. Here we can see this engagement in the Baroness's collage of Marcel Duchamp. Notice how she directly addresses Marcel shouting out his name in the left corner. And she also brings in his ready-made, the bicycle wheel right beside his head. But notice also how she transforms that subtly into a kind of spidery bicycle wheel. So she makes it her own, she makes it more organic. On the right, the second portrait of Marcel Duchamp is an assemblage sculpture in which she serves her colleague like a dessert in a wine glass, adorning him like a Siegfeld girl with feathers. The portrait was at once a portrait and a self-portrait. And uh, Janine has written a wonderful article on that very topic, if you would like more information. And of course, here the use of glass also references Marcel Duchamp's most famous work, and that was the large glass. It may also have been a reference to the fact that he was a bit of a boozer at the time, and alcohol was very much part of that scene, as were drugs at the time. Whereas Duchamp represented the cerebral in art, for the Baroness, the body always and consistently moved to the foreground of her art and became the vehicle to combat aesthetic traditions and bourgeois pretensions. Dada was not just about mischief making. Dada also presented an extreme of sorts. It had a radicalism to it. Dada deliberately courted obscenity, focusing on waste products during a time when human life was being squandered on the battlefields by the millions, and soldiers were forced to live in the mud, confined in the underground labyrinths and dugouts. Like no other art form, Dada conjured this material reality by presenting bathroom matter, dirt, the lower bodily functions in order to stir up strong feelings, including disgust, rather than soothe spectators with reassuring pleasures. Shock, provocation, and ridicule were the goal. Collages, sound poetry, profanity, and aggressive attacks on sacred value systems like religion were the medium that carried this anti-war message and revolutionary message. Seen here in the slide is the assemblage sculpture, God. The Baroness's collaboration with Morton Schomburg, which presents perhaps a quintessence of Dada. It consists of a twist of bathroom plumbing fixtures mounted on a mitre box and sardonically pointing to heaven. A sacrilegious work, the sculpture aimed to deflate the power of God and religion. I spit on an unsuccessful Christ, she raged in her autobiography. I like the proud Satan state better. Such a fierce critique also reminds us that God and religion were key in the recruitment of soldiers on both sides of the trenches. The rawness of the brass pipe conjures the detonated brass shells in Belgium and France, which were often repurposed by, by the soldiers for trench art. This 1917 work perfectly coincided with the US entry into war. The God sculpture also works as a sister piece to Fountain, the infamous urinal signed R. Mutt and attributed to Duchamp, uh, which was submitted as a work of art to the 1917 Independence Exhibition, and of course, uh, infamously rejected there. 
Here we see Fountain on a pedestal in Alfred Stieglitz's studio. He took the photograph of the original uh, with the urinal rotated on its back and photographed against Marston Hartley's painting, Warriors. So again, we have that connection to war. From 1913 to 1923, the Baroness used New York's con consumer culture and Manhattan street landscape as raw materials for her art. She was the first to make art out of the junk she found in the streets. Sarah, if you find a tin can on the street, stand by it until a truck runs over it, then bring it to me, she told her friend Sarah McPherson. And with this, she also quickly became a precursor for others, for Man Ray and Marcel Duchamp, who were about a generation younger compared to the Baroness. In her flat, she collected celluloid, tin cans, and so on, all the objects that she had found on the street or purloined in Wanamaker's department store. In this slide, we see her limb swish assemblage a large whip-like device made of a golden curtain tassel and a large metal spring with a Christmas tree candle holder clip at its very end. The title is an erotic pun on limbs wish and limb swish and so also kind of plays with the Baroness's crossing of gender boundaries and her presentation of herself in ma very masculine roles. She wore this limb swish uh, gear attached to her hip belt as a kind of performance gear, sort of like a cowboy might wear a cold revolver. And since the colorful tassels were used at the time by German soldiers, yeah, especially to hold the bayonets, and also mark their, uh, their battalions to the colors, yeah, that, uh, the, the colors of the tassels and the wreaths around it, for example, the swashbuckling Baroness's enormous ta tassel also alluded to the war. And as she walked along the street, she created her own kind of live Dada body music by swishing this device back and forth and pioneered an entirely new art form, namely performance art. And it is interesting to note, I juxtapose this limb swish with uh, the lampshade by Man Ray, because we notice some interesting visual echoes in Man Ray's 1920 unfurled lampshade sculpture made of paper and mounted on a mannequin stand at first. And later, as we've heard earlier today uh, in uh, Edouard's presentation, he remade the sculpture in metal, which he then painted white. In 1924, the lampshade spiral reappeared in his Paris photograph of Dada is Tristan Sara and Jean Cocteau, where the unfurled lampshade is now reapplied to the body. Whereas the Baroness centrally showcased the body, here the male bodies are entirely veiled by fabric. The lampshade's spiral acting like the Baroness's long dash in poetry, sort of both and simultaneously severing, but also connecting the two heads in an edgy group portrait. Imagine the Baroness then in 1915 to about 1923, wildly parading her attached objects to her body, including a tomato can bra long before Andy Warhol turned the Campbell soup of bra into art. With her art imprinted on her body, she commandeered the, a new audience of street spectators. And we can pose the question, what exactly is the meaning of such art? And we can read more about that in some of the publications. Uh, but maybe just one quick answer uh, may suffice here. The German Dadaist Hugo Ball has described the project of Dada as a way of de-automatizing the public, as he put it. Quote, Dada was to, quote, conceive everyday life in such a way as to retrieve it from its modern state of colonization by the commodity form. And in a way, the Baroness lived that principle. She stripped the found object of its utilitarian meaning, decolonizing it, 
and creating artistically liberating epiphanies for her viewers. The Baroness used consumer objects even in her experimental poetry, as in her Subjoyride uh, Sub series. And I'm going to give you just a very brief flavor here, obviously created as the Baroness kind of shot along in the underground and picked up on the advertisement slogans of the time. The poem starts out like this, ready to wear American soul poetry, the right kind. And I just skipped to page two then of the manuscript. Lux camel hands off the better Bologna's beauty. Get this straight, Wrigley's Pino's heels for the wise. Nothing so pepsodent, soothing, pussy willow, kept clean with Philadelphia cream cheese. <laughs> and you can see how she's loading up the poem here with these fragments that she found uh, in, her, uh, in her travels along the subway. And I see I only have five minutes left, so I'm just trying to focus on some of the most important items. Uh, maybe we'll just skip this one, which is a portrait by Biddle and a performance act in a gallery. And uh, we'll also skip this one, uh, which is by Teresa Bernstein, who was a very good friend of the Baroness's and who painted her and who also kept her parrot uh, when she had to go to prison for showing herself in the nude in New York at one point. And uh, maybe with this, we'll move right here to um, uh, a performance act here with Man Ray and a collaboration with Man Ray. Uh, for in 1921, the Baroness uh, uh, performed in Man Ray's first film experiment, and only a still, unfortunately, has left, uh, has, has survived, and it shows the Baroness's exuberantly bared body surrounded by Man Ray's letter to Tristan Sara. And notice his inscription here. Mère de la mère de la mère de la mère de l'Amérique. And of course, the Baroness's legs kind of gloriously posing in form of the letter A. Such daring and uninhibited bearing of her body illustrates what the Baroness herself called her virile and anti-stereotyped posing as art that shocked the viewer and demanded containment for mass consumption. Man Ray could display this picture only in a private letter to Tristan Sara and perhaps by simultaneously declaring the death of Dada in New York. Shared Sara, Dada cannot live in New York. All New York is Dada and will not tolerate a rival, will not notice Dada. There is no one here to work for it, etc. And of course, then he moved on and went to, uh, to France. And I'll launch right into my conclusion from that. Here we also have uh, Marcel Duchamp. And I just want to draw attention to this uh, oh, wonderful sort of gender pose. What I find fascinating about it too is that by the 1920s we have these fascinating enactments and, and transgressions on the level of gender uh, at the same time that the Baroness, of course, had already been performing uh, this body kind of beforehand uh, from at least 1913 on. Uh, we'll skip these ones too. The Baroness's uh, engagement here with Berenice Abbott, who was Man Ray's assistant. And here you can see also some of the references. Uh, she was good friends with Berenice and uh, painted and uh, made this lovely collage on the left, which is held at MoMA today. But then when Berenice didn't support her properly, she uh, accused her here in one of her uh, other paintings, forgotten like this parapluis, M-I by you, faithless Berenice, she writes, of course, nicely rhyming here by misspelling the parapluie. And uh, perhaps just to end here on the words of the Baroness herself uh, from the cast Iron Lover, one of the things that I find particularly fascinating about the Baroness is that she kind of embraced the spirit of the time. For the Baroness, there was no safe 
living. She was always out there. She was always <laughs> risking it all. She was always pushing all the buttons she possibly could. And she said she was making the principle of motion and emotion the motto of her, of her life. And she sums it up a little bit in the cast iron lover where she writes, look full of laughter, look full of motion, look full of dizziness, insanity, and sane thine body. Thank you very much.